So hello everyone, welcome to this wonderful lecture session from the Horror Programme at the University of the Underground. I'm Aggie Haynes, I'm head of the Horror Programme, which is a critical exploration into illicit societal fears and human passion for horror. We're investigating institutions and popular culture through the lens of the horror genre in dramaturgy, film, costume making and more. The University of the Underground is a free, pluralistic and transnational university founded in 2017, and it was birthed in the basements of nightlife venues. So we're non-profit, we're a registered charity. If you'd like to donate, please visit universityoftheunderground.org and on this website you can find other exciting programming times and events and awesome lectures like this one that we have today. And I'm super excited because we have the fabulous Professor Samson Kambali, who's a wonderful artist and writer working in a variety of media, including site-specific installation, video performance and literature, literature, uh, <laughs> literature, among a lot of other things. Um, so his work is uh, predominantly autobiographical and approaches art as an arena for critical thought and sovereign activities. So born in Malawi, Kambalu's work fuses aspects of Nyao masking culture, uh, the anti-reification anti theories of the situationist movements and the Protestant tradition of inquiry, criticism, and dissent. So Kambali's first book, an autobiographical novel is of his first childhood upbringing in Malawi, The Jive Talker, was published by Jonathan Cape in 2008 and toured around Europe for four years. And he's been featured in a lot of major exhibitions, so I'm sure a lot of you are aware of his work already, and projects worldwide, including the Darker Biennale, Tokyo International Art Festival, and the Liverpool Biennale. Um, he was in included in All the World's Futures, which was at the Venice Biennale in 2015, and his public sculpture, sculpture called Antelope, uh, which features the Malawian Baptist preacher and Pan-Africanist John Chilembwe, has recently been selected to go on to the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square in London uh, this year, 2022. Uh, so Samson did his PhD on the problematic of the gift and is a professor of fine art at Ruskin School of Art and a fellow of the Magdalen College Oxford for the university. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please feel free to share your slides. Take it away when you're ready, Samson. Thank you. All right. Uh, 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 is it Aggie? Aggie. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'm on, on the city. Thanks for having me and inviting me. Um, I've been working with your dad on this sculpture, actually, you know, artifacts, and uh, I'm more than happy to be here. Uh, I've always worked well with Steve. I think he understands how artists work. And that, that, that helps a lot if somebody understands the creative process. And, and uh, yeah, so we, um, uh, yeah, I, I, he, he doesn't have a website and I had to get in touch with him by other contacts and I was happy when he replied that he would want to do this project. Because I heard that he says no to a lot of projects, as he said, yes to mine, and we met and uh, we hit it off and we worked really well, all the way from the market to uh, launching it at the National Gallery and being selected. So it's been a successful journey and I'm looking forward to, uh, to what's coming ahead to put in this large sculpture we're making at effects on Trafalgar Square in September. Uh, so actually I'm gonna start with that. I'm gonna start with my sculpture antelope. And it actually comes from my interest in the so-called cinema of attractions. And cinema of attractions is um, a kind of cinema that developed early, you know, it came from, some people say it didn't come, really come it's not part of history, but rather it, it's a continuation from uh, uh, like, uh, like magic shows and uh, 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 what, what do you call it, circuses and stuff, you know, magic lanterns, you know, these shows that magicians, traveling magicians would go around and show and, 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 and uh, amaze people. And uh, this is, and so when the Lumiere brothers are making their films and George Millet's art historian, such as uh, Tom Gunning, who coined this expression, cinema of attractions, uh, they said that their influences were more that, you know, magic shows. So for me, I would like to take that. I am interested in, in the fact that the film moves at all. 
before the narrative narrative comes in. In fact, several art historians that talk, Gani will say that, uh, or like uh, Jennifer Wilde uh, would say that film died in 1921, or depending, maybe in 1918 when Griffith made uh, Faith of a Nation, the film on the Ku Klux Klan uh, or Charlie Chaplin's The Kid. So because before film is seen as a series of gags, as a, you know, like a magician performs on stage, it's, uh, unleashing a series of attractions before an audience. But after uh, Griffith comes into the birth of a nation about the Ku Klux Klan in America, uh, in, in which indeed a lot of, uh, you know, the birth of, the birth of a nation could be the birth of the demonization of black people's in film screen. But anyway, um, he, um, he says that film comes to an end, you know, it comes to an end because film should be film. We should be happy that the film um, moves at all. If we are not satisfied with that, we're not talking about film, we're talking about theater. So, okay. So I was, I'll talk about cinema of attractions and how it relates to my practice uh, with my background in Africa because I grew up in Africa and I only moved to Europe when I was 24 to do masters, settled in, practiced for a bit and then did my PhD. I traveled to America a bit and I found myself at Oxford. I just stumbled into it. I was just trying to avoid getting a job, basically. <laughs> so I stayed in school. <laughs> First, and when I finished my, 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 my PhD at Chelsea, I was very miserable. Uh, I was no longer going to have an excuse for not getting a job. <laughs> I was enjoying my time sitting in cafes, living minimally, reading. And that's how you end up at Oxford, precisely of my 15 years of slacking. <laughs> you know, if you get a job, you can do what I do, because I was a full-time slacker in the cafe. Like Jean-Paul uh, Sartre or like Baudelaire. I just hung around and made my films, which I'll show you as a kind of flaneur, you know? Um, yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll do, um, I'll, share, I'll share my screen so you can see my PowerPoint. Cinema of attractions, okay. Let's see. Yeah, okay. So this is a, 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 the maquette of, a, a making with that effects um, by this barber, Steve. Is a great, you know, make of these things, and uh, yeah, it's basically Pan African. It's his friend, and and this sculpture is based on a photograph, so you can see at work already. Although I'm making a bronze sculpture, my profession with the, uh, with film, the image is already uh, at work. I don't think you can appreciate this sculpture without considering movement. There's a a small and the big figures, and the two figures seem to be cursing each other. And for me to really see this sculpture, I have to move around. So this sculpture is more a vignette actually, although it looks traditional, but in my opinion, its meaning comes through movement like film. And uh, I based it on, um, on uh, this photograph I'll show. This is a ghost market, which I'm showing in Lisbon at Kasha Guest. Look like that. And actually this is pretty much scales Trafalgar Square, I think, you know, the, the, the it's a very, huge uh, uh, plinth and the person really is at the bottom there, a six feet. Uh, but that's how it will look, you tower over Trafalgar Square and Chilembe is the biggest sculpture there, uh, along with Nelson. Uh, the other figures on the Trafalgar Square who are generals are uh, as big as this small figure, it looks small now, but then if you think, I think Chile was about the size of a horse. <laughs> so there's a politics there. This is an Epistelian uh, uh, plinth. So for me, instead of the horse, I just enlarged uh, Chile, who is a Pan-Africanist who died in an uprising for the right to wear a hat. It was illegal in Africa to wear a hat before a white person. I'll show you here. So he made this photograph months before his death. And this photograph was actually a photograph of defiance. It looks ordinary now, but he distributed it among his followers and he was supported by his friend, the English missionary, John Charlie. And he's the small figure you can see on top there who stand with him. But that's what I did. I, I, when I got a, an email from the mayor's office, I knew I wanted to, to, I had this photograph on my phone 
because that's what I do. I do search images and wait for them to inspire my films. And when I got uh, an, uh, an email from uh, um, the London Mayor's office to propose, I had this picture. I was like, okay, it's gonna be too many in a heart. But I didn't quite know how I'm gonna interpret this photograph into a sculpture. And then one day, usually my ideas come to me in the, at around 3 a.m., 4 a.m. in that working hour. I just saw the big figure get large. And that, it makes sense actually, because he has a, ma a main style of this sculpture, he rises. This is almost like film poster as well. There are all kinds of associations with this, this sculpture. It doesn't have one specific meaning, um, but it's really revolving around the logic of film. You know, the poetry of this is around the logic of film, and I'll show you how it's connected to Nyao masking in Malawi. This is, this is a strong relationship between traditions of masking in Africa and the cinema. Uh, during colonial time, the Africans who worked in the mines, they went to South Africa, Zimbabwe, brought back films, and they would travel from village to village. And for me, in my opinion, film, when I was growing up, had taken the place of masking. You know, in traditional times, we would go to see a masking show, a masking performance. Now we, we went to cinema. Um, so this photograph, it's, his name, John Chilempe, means this sculpture. This is a, it comes from a Chewa tribe, which is also my, my tribe. And basically it's a matrilineal uh, society. Society is built around the raising of kids. So it's, it's, it's a built around women and children. And the, the central um, sculpture uh, of, of our principle is not a woman like you do in, in, in the West, that the woman is put pedestal on a pedestal. That means you can't have another life because she's a goddess now. Just to stay on the pedestal. In Africa, it's just a womb that uh, represents the matrilineal. And I think matrilineal maybe is one of a better word. The Chewa children are known as children of the lake, you know, Malawi has a lake. And for me, it's, it's children of the primordial place. I think represented by this womb. This is, uh, this is the face of the deep. <laughs> You know, this is this cover, uh, this mask covers this void from where everything comes. This uh, a, a, a void of, this void pregnant with possibilities. Um, and it's, 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 it's a pubis actually, it's upside down. The way you can see, it's secret. It looks like an antelope, but actually it is a, a female anatomy in a way of the pubis, the, 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 the womb. If you like, oh no, I'll leave you to uh, think about that one. Um, anyway, so for me, my work exists between um, film and this, this tradition. This when in this mask is worn, I'm, sub I'm not supposed to say it's worn. I'm supposed to say the masks come from the river. But anyway, a scholarship. <laughs> I'll say when the mask is worn by either two men or one man, and it usually dances round and round, you know. I think Aggie should like this one because I've noticed her work. She likes to take all this stuff out of the body. So please, it's, <laughs> it's another feature taken out of the body and, and used for, for, for art. Um, and it dances round and round. Anyway, so uh, I'll show you an example of my uh, film, which I make while I'm traveling. I started making these films when I left Africa. And for me, they're a form of blossoming because uh, I, I never prepare for them. I just walk around with a camera in my pocket. And when I see a scene of possibility, a found film set, I transform into this mysterious figure. You know, who is this man simply crossing across the photograph? And I made this film in Switzerland. In that moment, when I enframed this uh, landscape inspired by my knowledge of romantic art, it's such an African masking. I came up with this film and the early film, you know, where one is happy that the film moves at all. No narrative. Uh, cinema of attractions, if you like. Uh, uh, films like this will be shown in early, uh, in turbines in the late 19th century and 20th century. And people get excited when the magician came and showed them a man walking. Everybody was uplifted. I'm interested in rediscovering that simple magic. Um, a Thousand Years, this is another film I made 
on a building site in London, in Kensal Green, where my studio is. It still is. I, I, I'm renting it out now. I moved to, to Oxford, but I was in Kensal Green a long time. Uh, Kensal Green, yeah. Um, yeah, so building site, sand, dust the sand off, and you make this uh, repetitious uh, figure, dusting sand into eternity. Uh, I don't know what this angel is. My films are psych psychogeographical. I transform. I become part of a larger scheme of things. I'm able to escape the everyday uh, realities of everyday life through medium of film. And in this moment, although it lasts a few seconds, um, I can rediscover that a magic of just being in the world. My films are filmed by um, strangers. So usually I just stop people to film me. So it's a form of uh, creating social relations. Pretty much like watching film when I was growing up, the so-called cinema of attraction or like, uh, you know, or like masking, you know, film, the whole point of a masking is that it, it, it takes us beyond rarification. The world of work reduces us to the world of things and masking is a form of blossoming. It's how one rediscovers their selves as part of a larger scheme of things, you know? This is, so the mask is not so much that you're trying to hide or to masquerade, but it's actually so that you become, you can review your true self, you know? It's in masking. For me, when I look at my, my, my films, it's imprecise in these films that I, I can really identify with myself more than even the, the everyday persona that I have now, that I have to transgress through this, uh, this persona of necessity that I have to transgress through uh, films. And then this is why early in the 19th century, people went to magic shows. They wanted to be part of a larger scheme of things, you know? You go see a magician, a magician cinema of attractions about revealing those moments where people are able to escape the confines of their everyday life, you know, maybe as a teacher, as a, a cinema of attraction is very different from, um, from, from film as we know it now, which is theater and more passive. Cinema of attraction was always a social thing, very active. Um, I wonder if you guys maybe have seen something, something like cinema, cinema, cinema Paradiso. Uh, but but yeah, yeah, when I was growing up in Malawi, when I, I went to, I, I saw uh, traveling projectionists, they would travel with worn down cinema wheels and uh, they would set up, they would load them. And I remember watching all these films that were highly edited to make them non-linear for an African audience, African sense of time, or time of the mag of a magical time, rather than more structured the world of work or theater that we have now. I would, um, uh, I, I would uh, I would see this and, and when, when I came here, I began to see this film again, partly because I had gotten a laptop and I my laptop and discovered this editing, you know, Final Cut and I moved it. I was like, I could turn back on time. Because otherwise to create the, the kind of films that I was watching as a child, I would have to have a lot of, have a lot of strips of film like this projection is used to have. So uh, uh, having new technology, for me, I like to com combine this old aesthetic with new technologies like traveling in time to this socialized cinema of my childhood. We also had the proper cinema in Malawi, but me and my brother, we used to escape home and we preferred the markets, the Sabotin kind of film that perhaps my dad as a civil servant wouldn't approve of it, <laughs> but we would escape because that was more exciting. In this, you didn't have to sit passively. You could talk, people walked in and out. The films were non-linear, they were action parks. You didn't need to follow them from beginning to an end. There was a lot of freedom there. Uh, unlike the, the kind of gentrified film that we have now. That freedom has come back to us via the internet, by the way. So I'll get to that. Um, okay, this is a, a, an installation I made at White Chapel with uh, my experiences of watching cinema as a child. And it's an extraction actually from my PhD. There was a chapter there where I was describing African cinema, a form of cinema that takes nonlinear sense of time as opposed to durational one of Bergson, if you like, it depends on two philosophers. The philosophers I went, I went for to describe my nonlinear approach to time, which is read African time that you can hear in jazz, blues, in bachelor. He, talk of, he, he talks of time as a series of rapture, 
not duration as Bengtsson would put it, but rather rapture. And, and, and definitely this is the African thing to do. In Africa, when you have you, you put a film and if it's too linear, people start talking. So if you really want to engage them, you have to deliver from moment to moment. Hence the projection is to be editing the films. And this is the same sense of time that I've adopted in my uh, work. You know, the good thing about modern projections, you can combine text and, and moving image. You can do this. You can project in light. So I really think it's really magical. Okay. So um, I'll describe a bit how uh, a cinema uh, arrives in Africa as a form of uh, blossoming. Um, cinema of attractions, if you like. And I, I, I arrives and, and we can start with perhaps our because the films that we were used to watch in Africa came from America, Hollywood. So maybe I would start there with this phenomenon called uh, Ghost Dance that was started by an Indian shaman called Jack Wilson or Walker. He, he asked Indians, uh, Native Indians, uh, Native American or the first people of the First Nation to dance, to perform this dance. And then if they did, they were promised that. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, Buffalo returned to the plains of America. The Buffalo that has been disseminated during the expansion of America West. Uh, and the, the good old days would return for the Native Americans. And of course, American government found this uh, dance disruptive, stopped people from going to work in the reservation. And they set about uh, putting it down. And they did. But before, um, it was put away. Jack Wilson promised the people that um, the ghost dance would return by an iron horse or something like that. Uh, and this is what happened. How does the ghost return to, to the West? It was through uh, the railroad. The railroad not only brought uh, uh, expansion of the Western frontier, but also cinema with it. So you find people uh, from Britain who worked uh, you can find this uh, in this terrific book, by the way, by Rebecca Sonnet, on the relationship between uh, the ghost dance and, and film. Yeah. And um, you can see these are early. This is what my bridge who left Britain, uh, England, was doing in California, inspired by a sense of time in the West. You know, if you study these photographs, a lot of people say that they are study of the movement of horses, but actually, if you study these photographs, there's no science in them. <laughs> they are arranged to uh, for, for, for what looks good or what feels good. So they are more art than science, really. My bridge pretends oh, I'm studying horses, but actually I arranged them for what feels good, you know? So for me, that's a ghost dance already returned. It's a form of dance, this, uh, and, and, and I like this sort of early film of attractions because it's, it's, it's unlike what's coming. Film as subject to narrative. This is film as film, movement. There's fascination with the movement of film itself. You know, all this is not exactly science. It's, it's, it's arranged according to what looks good. My bridge himself blossoming through the medium of film. He was known as an eccentric, and I think it, uh, for definitely a sense of time in the West uh, inspired his way of looking at the world. You know, the, the, the West has had an impact on the, on the settlers as, as, as it did on the Native Americans, you know? And this is what happens in Africa too. That colonial cinema is twisted and, 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 and sent back to Britain as, a, as Nyao cinema, as a cinema of attraction. Um, so in Britain, uh, cinema of attraction is especially work, uh, uh, popular with the working classes. The, 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 the gentle classes, <laughs> the middle classes, if you like, they, they didn't pick up on cinema until 1921, uh, when cinema becomes subjected to, um, to narrative. It became respectable. People could go passively sit in their place at the cinema. And, 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 and in the, the gentle classes of uh, <laughs> Britain found Cinema attraction, or even my dad too, being a senior civil servant, they found cinema um, of attraction uh, vulgar, you know? 
So he, he, for a long time, Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, this, this was stuff for working people. And it's only 1921 when film is subjected to narrative that the middle classes pick it up as a kind of viable art form. So me, I'm interested in this more exciting with pre-1921 form of film. You know, and this is a, a Mitchell and Canyon, a film that a, early of the 20th century, they would travel from town and town and they make terrific, you should look them up. They made terrific films of just people looking at a camera being filmed. The excitement of film, it's remarkable, the magic of, of Mitchell and Kenyon. There's no narrative in their films. It's just these people excited that they're being filmed at all. And you see the, they are boss from it. Um, Charlie Chaplin, I, 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 before he sold out with the kid. People think the later Charlie Chaplin is more exciting, but if you're uh, a, a hardcore cinema enthusiast like me, that's when Charlie Chaplin sells out, you know? <laughs> I, I've been asked by producers, Santon, are you gonna do a movie? It's like, no, I'm not gonna sell out, it's like Steve McQueen, you know? I'm gonna stay with this. <laughs> this I did like his small acts though, but the, the one about um, the reggae, and then people smoking weed on BBC and just dancing. And anyway, uh, and I did like his uh, Steve McQueen's first film, uh, Hunger. I'm not too sure. Now I think otherwise it's happened to be just a normal director, you know, which for me is not very interesting. <laughs> but uh, so, um, uh, anyway, LA film, poster work. So in my work, actually, what I do around film, I'm not just interested in the moving image, I'm interested in the cinema dispositive. So you see that's my preoccupation with cinema, as I've showed you, has appeared as a form of sculpture on Trafalgar Square, but as text, as you saw at White Chapel, and I don't know what next, all kinds of stuff I can pull out from the tradition of cinema to, 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 to make a, to practice as an artwork. Cinema for me is not just a moving image, but it's the whole dispositive, the whole apparatus of cinema that I can use as potential art form of a kind of, a, so that's what I'm doing. That's what I research. I research posters, I research projections, I research and, and then see if that could help me make art. So uh, if you want to know a contemporary form of cinema attraction is the internet. You know, nowadays people can make memes, they can fast forward things, they can. So for me, when I came to Britain, I found the internet very liberating. In fact, I wrote most of my PhD and masters in internet cafes. Because I don't know whether the internet cafe still exists now, <laughs> but when I was in Kensal Green and Nottingham, this is where you met Africans. You all assembled in these internet uh, uh, places. And it was like, you know, uh, it was a kind of non-structured cinema. You know, you could look at image, you could browse at your own pace. And it was a very social affair. And when I started making my films, as you can see, I, I, I first uploaded them on Facebook. And believe you me, I was discovered on Facebook as an artist. Yeah, I put these films as a feed. When I was traveling as a writer, I had written a book after my master's in Jive Talk about my growing up in Africa and translation to Germany. I traveled a lot. And I would put these films uh, because I was fed up with just being this anonymous person in the city going to a museum, taking in information. The films allowed me to be part of the place, to bring something to a city, rather than just kind of me going to a city and consuming it. And I used to make these films in Yam Cinema and put them on the internet and I'll share them with my sister. And then a, a, an art historian saw them and then a, a curator saw them in, in, in South Africa and gave me a show. And, and then that's how I uh, joined the art world as a signed artist. But for a long time, for three years, I was just simply putting these films online. And that's why I, I still prefer them now. I show these films in galleries. But for me, I like the idea that I could show you my film on a phone, you know, and that's enough. I sit on a train, people ask me, what do you do? I tell them I'm an artist. Oh, what kind of work do you do? I pull out, a, 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 I pull out a, my phone and show them. So this is uh, soon after, uh, I was invited to Venice by Okui. Really liked my films. You saw them in South Africa when they were projected. Uh, and invited me to do this. 
makes too much too much hatch on me. If you know him, he's a very kind of flamboyant artist. And it's pretty pleased that I survived him. I think he had a huge in inspiration next door to me. I had rules eventually in 2013, uh, which I used to uh, to make sure I get a good Nyao cinema. If you don't follow these rules, I realize the film does it. In fact, if my films are longer than 30 seconds, they begin to lose the plot. Somehow, it's always around 30 seconds that they do what I, what I want to do. Okay, just, I always enjoy uh, designing film books. This is for Art Basel. A lot of films, by the way, my, my, my films have been collected, but they're also on YouTube. I like that. The collector comes to me uh, and they get the film. to get a box of Nyao cinema. And because uh, the film is nowhere. I like that idea that the film doesn't have one place of existence. It's just kind of, you can find it on the internet, you can find it in a gallery, you can find, you know, I like that idea. Um, okay, let's see, uh, before I stop here, this film is called, uh, Mountain Man, and I made it in California following footsteps of Edward Mybridge. <laughs> so, just outside San Francisco, but Mountain Man. Okay, um, next one. Malawi, I should show you where Malawi is. It's there near Mozambique, in case you did know. And uh, a lot of tribes in this little country, a former British colony, carved out from, from, the, from the Portuguese next in Mozambique. And I'll show you an example of uh, a Nyao mask. <laughs> You can guess what this is, right? It's, it's how our masks are in Africa, you know, in, in performance. It's, it's a much more a lively affair than the British Museum. Yeah. But I'll tell you what this structure is. It's, this, it's actually a train, right? It's a train. It's a form of Marian modernism, and you can see um, that's a small and the windows. And then I'll tell you another tr mysterious train from the West. This one. The music just as exotic. And as the scene just as mysterious. This is by the Lumia brothers in the early, late 19th century. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. So maybe you can, uh, 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 you can have questions, but I'll stop there. <sighs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Wonderful. It looks so wonderful to hear, hear you talking about your work. Um, 
I'm, I'm sure we have other questions, but maybe to kick us off, <laughs> I'm really interested in this idea that you portray different characters and they kind of get lost in time. So when I saw your films, it was I was thinking like, oh, when is this? Is this meant to seem modern? Is this meant to seem historical? Yeah. And and they kind of and I'm wondering whether you you name them certain things, but are they? do you position them in time when you're thinking about them or is that like a, a device that you use to give them more magic yeah i think uh, the whole point uh, i think about time is maybe you can defy it through these films and for me there, there's a, a lot of anachronism in the work you can see i look like in the past but people around me are wearing nikes and i like that uh, that, that, that you think ah, oh, you know I, I, that's a politics I've, I've not spoken about the politics of of my work, but you should know that masking is always associated with, uh, like for instance, the train that you saw in the village is a commentary on uh, progress on uh, new ideas that the British brought to Malawi of progress. And, and, and they make uh, the train as this kind of libidinal thing, you know, <laughs> it's, the, the, the African saw in the machine, not only utility, but also some kind of replaced, uh, uh, desires from the West that they are rendered more apparent in the mask. And that's a politics. And in my work, there's also a lot of politics, basically. Um, like I disappear when people are passing by in America or like I'm dusting, uh, I'm, I'm taking dust off my hair, heart forever in London. This is the politics. I think that every time I visit has is, inspires me to, uh, to deal with a certain issue. I mean, I'm, I'm at Oxford. I have so many issues I should deal with here, for instance, and I can deal with them uh, in, in a poetic form in the film. Um, uh, I've made some films in Oxford, for instance, you know, they, they make a commentary. Um, uh, you, you can look them up, like there's a, a film called Sculpture. In fact, one thing I really like is, uh, is simply, um, Simply going online and uh, let's say sculpture. Oh yeah, like for instance, I made this film. It's called Dawn, and this was be be before I became a professor at Oxford. This this film on, on the guy who has website. This this film. Simply called Dawn, and I made this in 2014 as a as a as a as a visit at Oxford, and then three years later I became a professor at Oxford. So it is a kind of a <laughs> very predictions. But there are politics, obviously. Everybody's walking backwards and they're walking forward. Uh, it's charged. An African in space, in a public space, is a charged thing, you know, it's an especially in a place like Oxford. Of course, when you see an African, it's a charged affair, you know. So, I, I, and these films try to make sense of that kind of atmosphere that so sometimes I experience as, a, as an African, let's say, moving in a, uh, out here. But I don't necessarily like to talk about specific things I'm dealing with. Uh, I think it's up to people. When I started Property Again seven the way, years ago, I, like I was literally hands. in bad debt. I just lost it's the business, of the, the official the liquidation. You stop that. You begin to see my film. For me, it's part of it. My guy is to say, oh, you should take them off YouTube. I was like, no, no, no. I like my films just to junk there. You can excavate them. <laughs> uh, you know, it's part of it. And you, you should know that actually, Cinema of Attractions has now um, migrated to advertising. The advertisers these days have all the fun, you know? You know, with Cinema of Attractions. So, so sometimes in my work, you could say that it's a form of trying to wrestle some of that time that now is just confined to advertising into the everyday life, like it was at the beginning of uh, uh, the history of film. And then you can see making a tree, but obviously I was thinking of the wind in the willows, Oxford has this romantic, of Oxford dawn walking, um, and I saw this. I thought I could do a, a sculpture. Of, uh, yeah. 
this is typical Oxford uh, atmosphere, you know, of, of no wonder it inspires ducks and stories about <laughs> toads and <laughs> folk, to, <laughs> folk role like Louis Carroll and stuff like that, because it has this kind of, uh, you know, and, and uh, I was inspired by that, but my own, um, so yeah, every film you could write about what I'm trying to do in there, but usually for me, the thing I prefer is to talk about context of my work. Um, yeah, I, I love to see my films like this. They said they are playlists here. Um, like for instance, this for me is nice. And rather than the sedate kind of presentation in a gallery, for me, I see all this stuff here. This, 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 this is how I started, you know, you can see a playlist of my film. I made this one in America, just running on the same place. I made this one in Norway, a boxer. Mm. Um, some are still, some don't move. They're simply there, like a cowboy's prayer. Because they like it like this. Yeah, it's a... Uh, okay. <laughs> mm. And Samson, can I also ask, are you like the... It, you were saying that there's you you involve it's a form of social engagement almost right like you involve yeah. us. Oh, it is definitely totally that it's very socialized yeah i never mm -hmm. in malawi we never grew up with museums the, 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 the sculptures were always in motion like you saw in the in the film it's it's it's, it's a lively uh the Nyao traditions are virulent in malawi mm -hmm. you know, they're, 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 this is what frustrated the british you know you know, this is how when you're growing up in Malawi, you can imagine me growing up with all this stuff. Oh, I'll show you something. I think it's a, my favorite mask. You grow up with this stuff in Malawi. It's all around you. And the, and, and the British tried to stump them out because they couldn't get Africans to go to work. Africans would rather go to this all day. And they, 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 they try to ban it, but they, they're still there. I want to show you my favorite. Uh, it has a great mimetic. What is it? Yeah, this this monkey here. It's funny. That's the way it works. <laughs> Anyway, a lot of these sculptures now are, are kind of uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, entertainment, lification, but I doubt it. I think that this mask will survive Africa, will survive. I don't think that modernity is what's going to be at the end. I think at the end of the world, it will be these guys. I'm really confident. These things are prehistoric. These are prehistoric things, and, and they've always been there. And humans tend to, to tend to these. I mean, the new forms of these are like memes that we have on the internet. Uh, and they will come more and more of that. The world will get more and more bizarre. It won't get more sensible. It'd be more like cyberpunk. <laughs> and so I'm saying that we are looking at the end of the world, not, not the beginning, but for me, uh, when I see these things, I'm inspired. And, and I did my PhD on this stuff in, in relationship to film. And when you study the complexity of the philosophies behind masking, it's amazing. It's like, I always say that when continental philosophy is finished, there will be this guy at the end, you know? <laughs> You, you, you know, it's amazing how these guys already worked out. This stuff is ancient, it's prehistoric, and, and, and they, they, they work like computer, it, you know? I think that you know, people call uh, Southern Africa underdeveloped, but I would say that for my travels, Southern Africa is the most difficult for capitalism to crack because the philosophers there are very robust. You know, you can take anything you want to Southern Africa, it won't work because there the computers against capital were developed over hundreds of years. Africans know how to resist rarefication. Here, yeah, it's something I have to study situation is you go to an art school for join a punk group or whatever. In Africa, anti-rarefication measures is automatic. You grow up in it. Uh, it's much more easier to, 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 
to experience certain levels of freedom in Africa than, than in places like here, who, who, which is still struggling from uh, the aftermath of the Roman Empire, you know. <laughs> Maybe this kind of freedom was experienced in Europe uh, pre-Roman times. Yeah, but in Africa, we, do, we didn't have the Romans coming to terrorize us. So we still have, a, we are not even citizens. Yeah, everybody is like a, an equal member of society. There's no such thing as like a citizen. You don't even vote. Everybody counts. So, and, and these are the things that make everybody count. Because as you can see, if you're surrounded by this chaos, everybody's equal. This is an equalizing force right here. <laughs> so if you really want to start creating class systems, notions of progress, hierarchy, you have to get rid of these guys. You know, and the, the British tried to do that in Malawi. They tried to ban this but it came back <laughs> and maybe they will uh, ex ex succeed in getting rid of them and then maybe we have class systems. But this is so far is at the center of how Africans live in more egalitarian you know, co communities where it's a cauldron of possibility. You know, When these guys come out, anything is possible. And this is very sedate uh, performance. In pre-colonial times, these affairs are real raves, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, real portraits. And then anyway, I'm just tapping into some of this in my work as an artist, because I grew up with this stuff. And, and it's not something that I even do for kind of a show. It's just, it's basically, um, I went to a Western school and at some point we were taught that these things were primitive. But I went to a very good Western school. I didn't come up looking down on these things, <laughs> you know. And I thought, wow, what I left in the village is something else that these guys are just prodding on it. You know, uh, Western civilization is built around uh, necessity. You know, in Africa, life is easy. Life is not built on necessity. It's everything, things grow, anything you want grows in Africa. And you don't have to be worried about extreme weather or, or what. Basically, you can live with nothing in Africa. You know, you don't even need shoes or a proper house. You're not gonna die. <laughs> so, so, uh, so uh, it's very easy to just sustain a certain amount of freedom in your life. And of course, this was seen as a, a backward, but I can tell you that it's not as easy as that. Africa is just simply too robust for capital. It just, they, they, they try to take everything there. It doesn't, <laughs> Africans are preoccupied. They still are, I was filming the boy Johannes wind, the wind two years ago. The raves are still happening in the villages. <laughs> you know, uh, they're mixed with new stuff and some of it is decadent, aimed at tourists. But there's also that real stuff still there surviving. Um, uh, yeah, I think this is for me what late capitalism is alluding to, aspect of uh, uh, maybe alluded to by Karl Marx as commodity fetishism. <laughs> but uh, anyway, there's a lot to talk about that, but uh, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, does anyone have any questions for Samson? If not, I have a number, I have a load written down. So <laughs> okay. one thing, but another, maybe I know we've, we've got a short amount of time, but I, um, one yeah. thing I was really interested in asking you is uh, one thing we're doing on this course is we're using horror as a means of like sharing messages. So yeah. you're, you're sharing quite interested pointed messages, but through sort of involving people and, you know, and we're looking at things like how to, use art horror as a means of talking about natural horror. And one thing I was wondering about your work is a lot of it's about shifting the lens or changing the perspective. So like the fact, I mean, when I first saw one of your gallery setups, I was like, oh, this is, it looks like a research exhibition, but actually, no, that's, it's a film, but it's just a different perspective on, you know, film that I've been, what I've been taught. And I was wondering how, you know, it, is that like an iterative thing that happens? So you're saying your film fits into these, like the context around the film is like extremely important, but is it, is it iterative? So you put it in the gallery and then you add something to it and then you add something else to it and you grasp things from around you and then you add something else to it and then it changes the meaning. Um, or when you come to put, to curate these experiences, mm. is it more, is it more that you you go okay? I want to say this, and these are the 
ingredients. No, I, I have tried to plan. It doesn't work well. If I say, oh, I'm going to, like, I went to the Black Forest to, to film around Heidegger's. I use a lot of philosophy in my way, going to the Black Forest to film mm-hmm. around uh, uh, Bayreuth, uh, you know, Heidegger's heart, and, and I went to Bayreuth. And I was specifically looking for issues of Wagner, and I had uh, Heidegger, you know, uh, because, you know, German philosophy is of interest to me. You know, um, but uh, it's best if I just don't plan and and allow the playlist to build themselves over time. So the best films are the ones I just go to a city and just walk. Let's say I go to York or I'll go to Paris. I just spend a week there and walk without thinking. And the films, it takes its own shape. And maybe films that are made in Paris might, might connect with some in New York. And so I assemble these films, it's ongoing. Uh, I don't know where I'm gonna show them. So when I'm invited to do a show, I look at the space and then I, I choose of something. Oh, this gallery is in this area. The architecture is this way. So I, I, then I think of how to, uh, to do specific uh, installation. You know, it's either I'm gonna use text, I'm gonna use, uh, I've just come back from, um, from uh, yeah, from from from, uh, from uh, Copenhagen. Uh, I think I was with. Uh, like here, you see, I've made this. I've used small screens. You can see. Don't look at my uh, social media; it's awful. Just, <laughs> just terrible to annoy people. <laughs> There's nothing constructive. Uh, uh, Ada, you can see. Uh, I've begun to make these paintings that are site specific, a, mi- a remixing of world flags, and I paint them. They, they follow the same principle of rearranging footage. You know, the same principle that I used to arrange rearrange f- footage. I've been rearranging flags because my films are very much about place, but I've been showing some of them on uh, small screens like this. It's an experiment. It allows me to, to bring in other works of art, like paintings. And I, it's, these are my kind of paintings. I, I trained as a painter a long time at school and I, I didn't find any subject matter, but I think lately I've been pretty pleased with these um, sculptures because they, they capture something of my attitude, you know, my, my their the immediacy. They're not like classical paintings. They, they are, they're cinematic, you know, they strike you. They're immediate, you can look at them walking. Uh, so, uh, it's stuff like that. I, I, and as I say, I deal with the dispositive. So the, 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 the wires that they call internet connections and the way I, I like to see my films and the wires become all the part of the film. But I did this because of the building, as you can see, right? It's, it's, it's got this uh, gray roof. And I thought if I use this naked metal, uh, these prints that seem to have gone surrealist and enlarged and become skeletons, talking about horror. There's a lot of horror in my work and there's mm-hmm. a lot of horror now masking. There's a lot of, uh, there's a whole point because there's a uni- unifying point as well. Um, so I showed guts, you know, like <laughs> inside of the uh, TV and stuff. For me, I like to show these are part of me of cinema and they allude to, you know, um, the, 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 um, but anyway, these are the latest developments in my work. As I say, for a long time, I've been projecting the films, but lately I've been playing with these modular film screens because they've just been made. I never used to find them. Before, when I tried to show my work like this, it would have bars on the sides. But these days you can find uh, modular screens in 4.3 that are very efficient. And you can start playing with them, uh, making these kind of like uh, totems, you know, mm-hmm. totems. And uh, yeah, but it's, they were inspired definitely by the architecture of this place, the roof, the floor, uh, the grayness of it and color contrast. I wanted that to come into play. It's, it's not always kind of a conscious decisions, but, but it's how you feel, you know, going through the space, feel it. And then you, you think, when I saw the space, I said, oh, so let's have to totems. Let's, let's have to, you know, I don't, I don't know whether you're aware of Indian totems, you know? Mm-hmm. Like uh, these totems, you know, they look like projections, you know, like they tell stories and they are, you know, they can different heights. 
this is a, my secret uh, framework for making those totems. I thought, oh, I'm gonna mount different stories and I'll use modular screens and they will do the same thing. Because this is a sense of time that's in my work, actually, you know, kind of. These traditions for me, I, I look at these, some from Malawi, some from other parts of the world, as long as we share the same sense of time, I can begin to use these things to translate them into our modern uh, sculpture. And sometimes people can't make that immediate association. There's a lot of relationship in, in, in uh, pattern making in Africa and my paintings. You know, if you look at, uh, Let's say if you look at Cuba textiles, you can see here, these textiles are fascinated by them. Although I don't, I never make anything as exotic as this, but these are the things I grew up with and are at work in my work in, in, in abstract. And, and if you look at the way, way I edit my films, the reputation in my films, let's say the man dusting the, the heart, if you were to translate the, 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 my films, they would take a form of a diagram, basically. You know, kind of. Uh, because these uh, diagrams, they reflect an African sense of time. I mean, these, the tribes people will be making this sculpture to, to you know, it's, this sense of time in here is reflected in African music, in blues, in jazz. Um, yeah, but it's a kind of time that never begins. It's not, it's a kind of time I like classical music. This sense of time in these can start anywhere. It's a, it's this kind of time that never begins or ends in any setting. It's a yeah, complex, but, but, uh, but I see, for me as an African, I see African time in this. I'm not, I, mean, I may not wear clothes like this, <laughs> but uh, I do identify with this stuff. And I just try to give them a contemporary interpretation in my work, in my installation. Uh, you know, the, the fact that you, can, you are immersed in my isolation, they have no beginning, you can start reading the text on the wall from anywhere. Um, stuff like that. So, so yeah, it's, it's about, and, and what the, 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 my, these processes mirror, mirrors Africa, is, is what we Africans, in, we have to do with post-colonial, we have to translate old traditions into new ones. Uh, what I'm doing in my work is what an African has to contend with. But not only African, you know, we, we uh, I would say anybody contending, uh, tarrying with modernity has to, uh, people have to do here. People don't know what to do. They would rather opt for Brexit than tarry with this stuff. <laughs> so, oh, no, no, it's too much. It's, it's a Brexit, let's bail out, you know. We, we can't, we can't, this is too much now. Let's go back to, to, to uh, British North of the 50s. It was easier, let's bail <laughs> out. <laughs> because if you're not doing this, if you're not translating, if you're not tarrying with modernity, then you're lost. And a lot of people, this is not just the experience of Africa, it's, it's here in Europe. It's, everybody has to deal with, <laughs> you, you yeah. know. Anyway, so, uh, I, and I would, I, would, I would just finish here to say that there's a lot of, although I, I, I don't pinpoint my, my work, they look like comedy, but I use a very aggressive chop, you know? The, the, the chops in, in these films are very aggressive. And for me, that's where the horror is coming in my work, this idea of a rude awakening. This, you know, uh, it's unlike a narrative which offers you that like life is all hunky dory. This is a sudden chop in the films where film is chopped up and rearranged. And for me, it prepares how I experience life is that I have to be prepared for, for, and especially in Africa where modernity is much more virulent, it's all things are unpredictable. So my films are forms of prayer of, of this kind of encounter. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in this chop, you know, this, uh, that, that, that sometimes has to be kind of even doubt in, uh, in film editing for me, the chop, where the footage is cut, it's there. And the film, my films look comical, but I would say there was also something tragic about that. If you, if you see the man in, in America, he's running on the same spot forever. Fine, it's entertaining. But what makes him run on the same spot forever? So, but that side I don't like to talk about. I, like any other artist, I don't like to talk about, what does your work mean? <laughs> I, I enjoy talking about the context of my work. Uh, how I make it, but don't ask me, why is that man standing on the same, same spot? Or why is this, uh, uh, so th th that I'll leave up to you to watch my films and making these interpretations or like links, uh, how, you know, but they're certainly about my experience of uh, 
uh, modern world as a cosmo cosmopolitan Africa, yeah. Mm. Okay. Oh, well, Samson, thank you so much for your time. And it's really amazing for us to as well talk a bit more in detail about how you curate your work and it can have such a impact on how different people perceive it. I think it's so insightful. Uh, so thank you so, so much for your time uh, and your wonderful talk. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> okay, let's keep in touch somehow. I would like to know more about the University of the Underground and I hope you visit me in, uh, at Ruskin and uh, Modeling. I think you should. Um, yeah. You can yeah. arrange. Uh, you keep in touch. So I said, let's keep in touch. I'm sure I would like to return this, uh, uh, you hosting me. Yeah, and, and we'll send you details. So the students, there are a number of outputs and we will have an online crit and I'll send you all the details so that you can see what the result is of this course at the end. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks so much. I hope it's been of some use and it's it's, uh, it's a lot to, uh, to decipher, but uh, I hope I've mapped up the terrain <laughs> a bit for you. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.